Okay, we're going to review chapter one. The first thing of the chapter one is matter. Second thing is measurement. And the third is calculations. And we're going to review all of that. So here we go. Okay, remember that we have matter, and matter has mass and volume in order to exist. So it has to have mass and volume to get matter. Remember that weight is not the same as mass. Weight is when we have is a measure of gravitational force pulling on an object. So mass and weight are not the same. So remember that. The other thing we need to do is talk about mixtures. Let's look at mixtures here. When we have a mixture, we have a proportion of components may vary. That means they're made up of a bunch of different things. They're not the same throughout. Um, their properties will vary with composition, and they can be physically separated into two or more substances. So if I can take one thing and make two, then I have a mixture. I could even take one thing and make many things. It doesn't have to just be two in order for it to be a mixture. Remember we talked about in class the sand, the salt, and the iron as a mixture, and Rocky Road ice cream as a mixture, and cookie, cookie dough. So if I can take it apart and get more than one thing from it, it's going to be a mixture. Let's look at the other side, pure substances. Pure substances have a constant composition. They're the same all the time. They have a fixed set of properties. This is where we talk about um, water being H2O no matter where you're going. Okay, it cannot be physically separated into simpler substances. It has to be chemically separated. So remember, with the physical separation, I can um, change mixtures and get more things. But pure substances, I cannot. Okay, if we take the one branch, pure substances, and break it down. Remember, pure substance couldn't be physically separated, but it can be chemically separated. We can get elements which are homoatomic, meaning the same throughout um, or individual atoms of the same kind. They cannot be chemically subdivided into smaller or simpler substances. It's just what they are, our elements on our periodic table. On the other side, we have compounds. These are heteroatomic molecules, meaning they have two or more kinds of elements in them. And they can be chemically subdivided into simpler substances, like H2O can be made into hydrogen and oxygen. And products of chemical subdivisions are either elements or simpler compounds. I don't always have to just separate it down into elements. I can make a simpler compound. Okay, remember that mixtures can be broken down into heterogeneous, meaning different throughout, or homogeneous mixtures, the same throughout. On the heterogeneous mixture, remember that was our sand and our salt and our um, iron filings. Now, homogeneous, we talked about Kool-Aid, if it's well mixed, remember that. And so solutions, for the most part, are um, homogeneous. So if I make any kind of solution in lab, or I make a solution of Kool-Aid, or I make a solution of salt water, that's going to be homogeneous. Heterogeneous, on the other hand, is if I make a peanut butter shake, where I, a peanut butter cup shake, where I have the peanut butter chunks in there. Remember that with a mixture, you have a variation of physical properties. You have things that make up that mixture that have different properties. For instance, oil and water in this picture have different properties. A soft drink, you have sugar, you have flavoring, you have water. They all have different properties, and they're just sort of mixed together so they have a variation. Okay, remember that we have chemical properties and physical properties. Remember the difference is chemical properties are basically how something reacts with something else, okay, how um, it is involved in chemical reactions. So how does it react is the key word here. Physical properties are um, where it boils, where it freezes, where it um, 
what's its density, uh, color, odor, as long as the odor does not change. Okay, um, those are all kinds of physical properties. You could even say, is it malleable? Is it ductile? Malleable meaning can I mold it? Ductile can I pull it apart. So those are the things you're looking at there. Whereas chemical properties, it's how does it react with air? How does it react with water? How does it react with? Um, does it corrode? Does it rust? Does it do stuff like that? Those are chemical properties. And then we've got chemical and physical change. Basically same thing. Just know that physical change doesn't change what a substance is. It's still wood. If I saw the wood, it's still wood. If I break the glass, it's still glass. So it doesn't change it. You also need to worry here about phase changes. And phase changes are when I'm going from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So solid to liquid to gas or backwards going from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a, a solid. So those are phase changes. Those are physical because I'm not changing what I have. I'm just changing the phase that it's in. Chemical changes change what is there. It changes what you have. So if I have a piece of wood it, and I burn it, I'm going to have its ash, which is different than what I had before, which was wood. Or if I bake a dough, it becomes bread, which is different from what I had before. Chemical changes change what I have. Okay, it usually is the result of a reaction. Okay, let's talk about the atom. Remember, that's the smallest thing that you can divide a chemical substance down into that still has the identity of that substance or that compound or that element. If you get smaller than an atom, you don't have the identity of an element in there or a compound. So it's the smallest that you can subdivide, that's the limit that you can subdivide it and still get the properties for a compound or an element. Now with an atom or uh, with a compound we can talk about homoatomic which is the same. Homo means the same. So it means I just have the same element. For instance O2 or O3 or Cl2 these are groups of elements, F2, remember our, our um, diatomics, I2, N2, um, Br2, H2. They're groups of elements that hang together, but they're the same. So these are homoatomic. Now heteroatomic, on the other hand, is when you have different elements like H2O. That's heteroatomic. And you have CH4, that's heteroatomic, or NH3, that's heteroatomic. Okay? Now, monoatomic means that I have one atom. So that would be like Na, or just um, helium. Just one atom. So just one element, monoatomic, one. Okay, we can also classify things as diatomic, which would be um, two, triatomic, which would be three, and tetraatomic, which would be four atoms or elements together, and polyatomic, meaning many elements together. So like C6H12O6 would be polyatomic. Um, a tetraatomic would be NH3. A triatomic, H2O. A diatomic um, could be just like O2. Now let's go back up here to the top just for a minute. Remember that the atom is what uh, element, the smallest thing that an element can break down and get. Now if I have a compound, the smallest thing that a compound can break down into and still be a compound is actually known as a molecule. A molecule is a group of atoms that hang together. So if I go smaller than a molecule, then I become an element, which is the smallest I can divide it into is an atom. So when I go to subdivide them into the smallest units, element can only be subdivided smallest into an atom, and compound can be subdivided smallest into a molecule. Okay, so say I start with a glob of something, and I heat it up. 
okay? If I heat it up, and after I've heated it, if it turns into two globs of something, two new things, then what did I have to start with? Well, what I had to start with here had to be a compound. Now the two globs of things don't have to go down to elements, but they could be, or they could be two compounds. So we don't know what these are, compounds or elements. But I can definitely tell from it breaking down into two things that what I started with was a compound, not compounds, was a compound. Now you can say the reverse thing, um, if I have two things and they form one thing, then what I made was a compound. Okay, so what I made was a compound. If I started with two pure things, like two elements or two compounds, then I made a pure, or not a pure, but I made a compound, whether or not these are elements or not. Okay, so this is sort of breaking down from our grid before where we had elements and compounds on the pure substance side, and on the other side we had mixtures, and they are homogeneous and heterogeneous. Elements and compounds can combine to make compounds, and compounds can break down into smaller compounds and or elements. Okay, so let's go into measurements for a little bit. A um, couple of things that you need to remember. If you had a yardstick here, a yardstick is broken down into three feet. Feet was how, were how um, people used to measure. They used to measure with things that were attached to their human body. So that's where we get the feet and inches were was part of the finger. But everybody's was different. And so now we work with the metric system. And you need to be familiar with the metric system. I'm not going to take time in the video to go over it, but you need to know how to go from a meter to a centimeter to a milliliter to whatever. You need to be able to convert back and forth. You need to know that the basic unit of measure in the metric system is the meter. You need to know what a centi means, what a milli means, what a kilo means. Okay, Those are ones we use a lot, so you need to know what they mean. How much of a meter are they? Like a centimeter is one one hundredth, a milli is one one thousandth, a kilo is one thousand meters. This is thousand. Okay, you need to be able to take uh, degrees in Fahrenheit and convert it into Celsius and then convert it into Kelvin and back and forth. Remember I told you in earlier videos that I would only choose one of these to memorize and one of these to memorize. So choose which one you like, and then you're going to have to just solve when you need the other. But make sure you can go back and forth. So if you're given Celsius, you should be able to find Fahrenheit and Kelvin. If you're given Kelvin, you should be able to find Celsius and Fahrenheit. You need to be able to go back and forth and back and forth. Okay, you need to remember how to do scientific notation. You need to be able to take a number and put it into scientific notation. Remember that there is only one number in front of the decimal in scientific notation. Everything else goes behind. And then you do 10 to how many places you needed to move that decimal to get only one in front of the decimal. If you moved it because it was a large number and you moved it to the left, it's a positive number. If you moved it to the right because it's a very small number, it's going to have a negative in front of it. So review how to do scientific notation because you're going to need to know it. Along the same lines, you're going to need to know significant figures. Let's review. I remember I've got four quick and easy rules for you that will help you to remember what's significant and what's not. Okay, numbers 1 through 9 are significant. Easy. Numbers 1 through 9. Pretty easy. Okay, zeros between two numbers 1 through 9 are significant. So, for instance, if you have 1,001, those zeros are significant. That would have four significant figures. 
Okay, zeros that tell how well something was measured are significant. So if I have, for instance, um, 10.0, that tells me I measured all the way to the tenths place. So they're all significant here, and I have three significant figures. Okay, the last rule is a not significant. So if a zero just tells how big or how small something is, it's not significant. So if you have something like one, um, 10,000, those zeros aren't significant. Or if you have something that tells you 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, those zeros in front of the one are not significant. So if it tells me how big or how small, it is not significant. So hopefully you'll review those significant figure rules and you'll be good with that. Let's go on. Okay, let's go over the rules real quickly for adding or subtracting with sig figs. Remember to... Okay, so you're going to want to line up the decimal and go to the last place that all numbers have significant. So for instance, if you are adding up 10.0 and 2.57 then I'm going to line those up. The last place that they both have in common is the tens place. So as I add down, the answer I get is 12.57. I look at the number here. It is bigger than 5, so I'm going to round up, and I would report 12.6. This works for either adding or subtracting. So the rules with multiplying and dividing with sig figs are really fast, remember? Okay, so you count the number of significant figures in each number and then report the smallest number of significant figures. So for instance, if I had 2.3 times 10.37 equals, I would have two significant figures here. I have four significant figures here, so I only report two significant figures. So my answer should be around 21, I believe. I don't have a calculator with me right now, but it should be about 21. Get the idea? Okay, so you need to review adding and subtracting with sig figs and multiplying and dividing with sig figs, so you can do that on the test. Okay, so let's do some conversions now. You're going to be able to, you need to be able to use some conversions. And most of the conversions will be given to you on the um, exam, but you'll need to know things like how many inches in a centimeter or stuff like that things that are common that you need to be able to go back and forth. If you don't know your meter conversions, that would be a good thing to review. So let's go through this. Say that I had 3.56 yards, how many centimeters? So we're going to take 3.56 yards and start conversion. On the bottom I want to get rid of yards, so I know in one yard there are three feet. So now I can cancel out yards. The next conversion, I want to get an even smaller units, so I know in one foot there are 12 inches. And now I can cancel out foot. Then, in my next conversion, I know in one inch there are 2.54 centimeters. And now I can cancel out inches. Now I can look at this and the three feet to one yard that's an exact conversion. Twelve inches in one foot that's exact. One inch in 2.5 centimeters is exact. So when I'm doing a conversion most often I'm looking at the first and seeing how many significant figures are there and that's how much I'm going to report in the end which is three. My calculator answer gives me 325.5264. So I have three significant figures so my cutoff point is right at the decimal. The number after it is a 5 and it has numbers after so I'm going to round to 326 is what I would report. You need to be able to set up and do conversions like this. Most often times like I said you'll be given the conversions that you need put what you don't want on the bottom what you need to get to on top and make sure you end up crossing out all the units because remember we also called um, this factor label um, or dimensional analysis so we're keeping track of our labels so watch those labels and make sure they're in the right place don't just flip them on there
Okay, percent composition is another thing you need to know. Basically on percent composition, all you got to remember is it's the part divided by the whole and then times it by 100. It's just like finding your percent on the test. So my score divided by the test total, in other words, what I could have got, and then I times it by 100 to get it into percent. You've done this for years and years and years. The only difference is we're going to be doing, doing things that aren't tests. So put the part on the top, divide it by the whole, times it by 100, and get your percent. Okay, the last thing that we need to review for the test is density. Hopefully you remember density. Density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. And remember that little trick I told you about love being dense? You can just cut that hard in half and you got mass divided by volume. You can see that M divided by volume. So mass divided by volume. If you're given information, all you have to do is plug in. If you're given, for instance, density and you need to solve for mass or volume, um, say you need to solve for mass, just rearrange the equation so you get density times volume. If you need to solve for volume, then it's going to be mass divided by density. Easy as that. Plug in and chug. So you need to be able to manipulate that equation, find things, either find density or find the mass or find the volume. You need to be able to do that, so make sure that you remember that. Now, I left you a couple of things, some things I haven't gone into a lot of depth with, but you are responsible for it for the test. So make sure that you're ready to roll, and um, we'll see you on test day.